Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Foley National Directors Institute Checkpoint Web Conference. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and if anyone should require audio assistance during the conference, please press star and then zero on your telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Mr. Mark Plichta. Mr. Plichta, you may begin. Thank you. <clears throat> I would like to welcome everyone to the first session of our 2012 National Directors Institute Web Conference Series. We are at the beginning of our 11th annual NDI season, which program we started in 2002. As with our NDI programs in years past, we are looking forward to sharing the insights and experiences on co corporate governance issues that we think matter most to you. The goals and objectives of our NDI program have always been to provide practical insights and useful takeaways to directors, executives, and boardroom advisors. Materials for our previous NDI webinars and other sessions, including PowerPoint presentations and audio recordings, are available on our dedicated NDI website, which is foley.com forward slash NDI. Information regarding future NDI webinars sessions will be found on our NDI website. We also held our in-person 2011 NDI in Chicago on November 17th. Please go to our website to find many valuable program materials from that all-day program. Our next invitation-only in-person NDI will be held on November 15, 2012. Be on the lookout for information. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of our NDI co-sponsors, many of whom have been supportive to NDI for years, and some of whom are new to our program this year. AN Corporation, DF King & Company, Inc., Eversheds LLP, FTI Consulting, and KPMG, as well as our in-kind sponsors, Boardroom Bound, Inform Board Access, and NASDAQ, NASDAQ OMX. Before beginning our discussion, a few housekeeping items. Our conference day will last approximately one hour. During this time, you may submit questions via the Q&A tab, which is located on your menu bar at the top of your screen. We will try to answer questions at the end of the program, but if we run out of time, we will follow up with you individually after the conference. We encourage you to maximize today's PowerPoint to full screen by hitting F5 on your keyboard or from the toolbar menu selecting View and, click, and clicking on Full Screen. If you would like to print or save a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, you can do so by selecting the printer icon at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Foley will apply for CLE credit for you after the conference. If you do not, did not supply your CLE information when you registered, please email to Elizabeth Harris at eharris, that's E-H-A-R-R-I-S, at foley.com. Note that you must log on to both audio and video to obtain CLE credit. Also, it can take 16 weeks for us to obtain all CLE approvals. We appreciate your patience. Today our program is entitled Acquisition Selection, Due Diligence and Integration Techniques, Keys to a Successful Acquisition. We have a number of very knowledgeable people from a range of professions who will be leading today's program, including Daljeet Dougal, a partner in Foley Liner's Detroit office, whose international corporate practice focuses on cross-border transactions between the United States and India. David Rohde, a Senior Managing Director in FTI Consulting's Strategic Communications Practice, Steve Miller, National Lead Partner of KPMG's Integration Slash Separation Advisory Practice. Tony Berry, a Corporate Finance and Commercial uh, Senior Associate at Evershed specializing in M&A. Uh, he is uh, substituting uh, for Robin Johnson, who's on the slide, and who was unable to make it today. And finally, Jim Benite, Vice President of Acquisition Integration at Thomson Reuters. And now, with no further ado, I will turn the microphone over to Dalji Dugla Foley and Lardner to begin our program. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Um, as, as everybody knows, um, you know, this has been a challenging environment over the last few years with the, uh, you know, the struggles in the economy and the M&A market really taking a downturn. Um, we've definitely seen a uptick um, over the last uh, six to nine months in the M&A market, and we thought this would be a good, a good time to really talk about what uh, have been some of the keys to, to success in, in um, a lot of these M&A &A, &A transactions over the last few years and what we're seeing currently um, in the marketplace. Obviously, everybody knows that, uh, you know, due diligence and your investigation of a company pre 
acquisition is very important, so we're going to take some time to talk about that. And just as important, if not more important, is obviously the integration post, uh, post-transaction. So we're going to spend some time talking about due diligence, you know, pre-transaction items and, and integration items afterwards. And we're lucky enough today to have, you know, FTI and KPMG with us who have both have done some market studies and can provide us some empirical data on what they've been seeing. And uh, you have uh, you know, myself and uh, Tony from Eversheds, and we have Jim Benite, who uh, is we're fortunate enough to have with us today to give us some practical insights on what he has been seeing in the market in transactions that they've done. So uh, I think what I'll do is I'll turn it over to FTI right now, so they um, and uh, give David an opportunity to go through uh, his uh, empirical data on things that they've seen um, in terms of executing a successful transaction. Thanks, Ajit. David. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Rohde, and I run M&A Communications in the Americas for FTI Consulting. Uh, the success rate of M&A transactions is well documented, and as we all know, overwhelmingly unfavorable. So knowing this risk, why do so many boards and C-suites continue to look at acquisitions as a source of growth? Uh, this is one of the topics that we tried to explain in our research. Uh, FDI Consulting conducted a recent survey that evaluated the alpha stock performance of 811 transactions in North America over the basically the last five years in, to better basically understand why the deals fail and once, why some deals succeed. In the study, we explored the drivers of shoulder value in the hopes of building a clear a guidelines for improving the success of transactions. To better understand the trends in the industry, we then classified each transaction based upon the industry group uh, and based upon the types of transactions. So for instance, product, market extension, uh, overcapacity and scale type acquisitions, or geographic roll-up. Moving on to the next page. Consistent with prior research and supportive of widely held views on M&A, we found that only 41% of transactions create shareholder value. Interestingly, we also found that the market remains optimistic when transactions were announced, with over 50% of companies experiencing positive alpha performance on announcement day. All this is, of course, in spite of the long-held belief and evidence to the contrary. So then why do so many companies pursue inorganic growth options? One reason we found was that uh, while in the aggregate less than half of all deals produce positive alpha returns, those that do produce outside gains. So if you look at the right-hand side of the page, the average return versus benchmark for a successful transaction in our sample set was an astounding 44% compared to the average alpha return of negative 29% of unsuccessful ones. So clearly, m and presents both significant risks, but also the potential for outside gains. Our research also looked into transactions by industry and by deal types. What we saw was significant variability and a few clear themes emerged from the research. First, industries such as um, Energy and communications, media, and entertainment, as you see, outperformed other sectors. While one could argue this is because of increased specialization uh, or other factors in those sectors, a better explanation appears to be that companies consolidating the industry understand that bolt-on acquisitions like product or market extensions are deals done for reasons of overcapacity and scale produce the most consistent returns over a one-year period. We'll hone on this later and then Steve will obviously go into greater detail as well. But these, deal, uh, we will, these deals are typically closer to core alignment and often less complex, helps explain why, why, these, uh, why these sectors continually outperform. You'll also note that outperformance vary considerably by type of transaction. Most notably, transactions that saw industry conversions, as we're calling it, demonstrated the worst outperformance of around 14.5% in aggregate. I think of these transactions as much more in the mold of the AOL Time Warner type transaction, which is large in scale, highly complex, and transformative in nature. And like AOL, uh, these transactions erode existing boundaries of an industry and or create an emerging new industry. On the other end of the spectrum are deals that are done for reasons of overcapacity. These transactions are typically characterized by large synergy opportunities where the focus has been on eliminating capacity, gaining share, or creating operational efficiencies. 
I think of Sirius Radio and maybe XM Radio or certain aspects of the P&G Gillette transaction would fall into this category. Several other findings from our research also emerged. Uh, one, uh, a great deal of the emphasis, as we know, is placed on the importance of valuation and on delivering immediate uh, earnings accretion as being uh, key aspects of any successful transaction. While clearly uh, important factors, they're not clear-cut drivers of success from, our, from what our research has indicated. Our, our research has shown that purchase price and related valuation multiples paid do not contribute meaningfully to value creation. When you look at the multiples, the average valuation paid was around 13.5, 13.7 times EBITDA. Uh, just for everyone's notation, this is a pure number. and doesn't include performa estimates of synergies or any takeouts, um, often or which are often reported in transactions uh, of this type. We also found that among transactions that generate a positive outperformance, the median valuation was actually higher at 13.9%. Uh, thus, companies that perform better actually paid a slightly higher premium for the deals. Uh, that said, the correlation was, in fact, relatively insignificant. I believe it was around 0.7 uh, correlation, so it's relatively insignificant. We also found that uh, synergy execution to be proved to be one of the most important factors. If you look on the right-hand side of the page, 80% of the top-performing transactions achieved or were on track to achieve their synergy targets while conversely, 66% of the worst performing transactions were not on track or had already failed to achieve those synergy targets. Contrary to the longly held belief around the importance of accretion dilution in a transaction, our study also found that the level of accretion dilution did not prove to be a key determinant of success. We found that only 44 or 40% of the top 40 transactions were accretive to earnings in the first year, whereas a higher percentage, in fact, 50% of the worst performing transactions were actually accretive. Interesting, this research also shows that there was strong uh, correlation between ROIC um, and media performance in the first year. So while 53% of top performing transactions improved ROIC, 100% of the worst performing transactions generated a lower ROIC, uh, ROIC uh, by a median um, performance of almost 60% in the first year. So what does this all mean? Trying to tie this together in looking at types of transactions that generate the most consistent and outsized gains, the critical driver performance gap appears to be how the transaction aligns with the company's core business. So to the oil wall Time Warner example mentioned earlier, industry convergence transactions may push the boundaries too far behind the acquirer's core competencies. And this increases the level of risk, both in due diligence, as well as in integrating the acquisition, uh, includes, which includes uh, the, uh, the execution on synergies, which Steve Miller will mention, we'll discuss in greater detail later. On the other hand, transactions done for overcapacity almost always occur among competitors with similar business models. This, of course, helps to reduce the inherent risk of integration of a target. This hypothesis also holds up if you look at um, geographic roll-ups in market and product extensions, but it's, albeit it's not quite as clear-cut. Arguably, geographic roll-ups are done in a very similar business, uh, where there's already alignment in the core competencies. This is less true of a bolt-on acquisition of similar products, and I think of this as being some uh, transaction like HP's acquisition of Palm. So, in summary, from our research and advisory experience, we've identified five key characteristics to successful mergers. And we've looked at this from a macro perspective, um, almost from a macro perspective and a point in time perspective, almost like a balance sheet, while Steve will be taking much more of a, almost a P&L look at the trends over time and a deeper dive uh, specifically into synergy analysis. First and foremost, the acquisition process must be incorporated into overall growth strategy and tailored to fit the company's specific objectives. Fundamentally, uh, employees need to understand where the business is going if they're going to make better deal decisions. Second, a robust due diligence process will evaluate the risk along a number of dimensions. While synergies are often the easiest, while well, cost synergies, excuse me, are often the easiest to recognize, the validation of revenue synergies 
shouldn't be overlooked as revenue synergies often serve as a strong indicator of strategic fit as companies too often chase cost takeouts uh, through the elimination of capacity. Frankly, it's also indicative of um, a company's willingness to pay and it, the potential non-recognition of top-line synergies often mean that there would be deals left on the table. For the third and fourth point, it's critical to develop a communications infrastructure to effectively manage any integration process. It's important to celebrate wins, it's important to report on the process and to drive greater alignment and corporate sustainability in a period of heightened change for many, in stakes, many stakeholders, particularly employees. This can be done in a number of ways like establishing an integration leader, documenting key integration principles such as embracing the best of both uh, companies, something that P&G and Gillette embraced, and reporting on all process milestones across all stakeholder groups. Lastly, we've found that once the deal is announced, slow and steady does not the race win. A lack of communications and failure to make swift and certain action often will result in putting synergies at risk and damaging the long-term company morale. So with that, thank you for your time, and I will turn this over to Steve Miller. Thank you, David. Um, really insightful results and a great survey. We, we can't agree more with your points on um, for executing a successful transaction. So what I'd like to do is over the next 10 minutes or so is share the results of KPG, KPMG fixed global survey to examine M&A deals. And since our first survey, which covered the 1997 to 98 time period, we've seen some pretty interesting developments transpire to our newest survey, which covered 2007 to 2009. Um, as other of us on the call know, this was a period of transition. You know, it spanned the final months of the M&A boom in early 2007, the credit crunch of 08, and the global recession 2009. A lot of people, us included, you know, prior to getting the results of our survey back, you know, we knew this was a challenging period for M&A, but we were pleasantly surprised that some of the results actually improved from our prior surveys in directionally positive results, especially for those deal makers that kind of covered off the five points that David mentioned on the last slide around, you know, leading practice transactions and stacking the deck in their favor. So next slide, please. So in terms of just a quick overview on our survey objectives and methodology, and one thing we wanted to point out as we get into the numbers is there's some very slight differences in the quantitative output of the FDI survey we just went over and some of the quantitative output we'll look at in the KPMG survey. But there's some explanation behind that. In, in, from one perspective, it covered a different time period. The 2007-09 time period that we addressed is a subset of a broader view that FTI took. And also, as a combination, we had 160 interviews directly with corporate directors such as yourselves, and those results were factored in. But overall, I think what we'll see is that the guidelines and recommendations that come from the survey align very closely, as we've just mentioned, with the ones that David just went over. You know, the key themes for how to make a deal successful remain fairly consistent and continue to um, mature over time. So let's look at some data. This first chart trends the proportion of deals which enhance value against those that reduce value or were otherwise neutral. And by the way, that presence of a neutral category is also a slight difference in approach with FDI that we'll see as we look at the numbers as we go through. So when we look at the changes from that first survey in 1998 to the newest one, we're seeing a meaningful increase in deals over time that enhance value from the 17% to the 31% you see in that top, that top blue um, section of the stack bar chart. You know, in both of the results of our survey and just personal observations through having done deals for, you know, the last 15 years, a big part of this improvement is just a greater focus on better due diligence, more fact-based valuation, and especially on taking a more professional and rigorous approach to integration. Buyers have truly recognized the importance of building a sound integration strategy and then using some leading practice techniques to help turn that into a successful implementation. But if we look at the last survey covering the 2007-09 period and compare it to what was actually a stronger economic cycle in 2005 and 6, we actually saw an increase in successful deals from, you can see, from the 27 to the 31%. Some of the key takeaways that we saw, especially through our interviews, were the greater focus on domestic deals, which we showed generally fared better than international ones, that is. Fewer PE houses in the market, often due to the credit crunch, which led to softer pricing and just a better chance of completing a deal in prices that just allowed more value to be created. A lot more 
scrutiny on that value creation by stakeholders, and also an increased focus on deals that were being done for growth as opposed to reducing costs. And we'll actually look at that on the next slide. Another big takeaway which is mentioned was there were fewer PE houses active in the market during that period of time. And whereas our corporate respondents generally replied they felt like they managed to reduce the number of poor deals, some of the PE houses actually felt like the number of deals they completed during that period of time to destroy the value was a little bit higher. So the result of all this is it kind of brought the market back to kind of a rough three-way split between deals that create value, deals that reduce value, and those that are value neutral. But within the variance that you see across those series of surveys, it's fairly consistent. And so it kind of begs the question, are there trends which um, is supporting this split? And we think that's the case, which we'll look at on, on the next slide. So why did we have more good deals? We kind of mentioned um, the reduced private equity competition for deals really let corporates be a little bit more careful in their selection of targets and take more time to avoid overpaying. That decreased access to credit increased the difficulty of sort of extracting returns by simply divesting at higher multiples. And what we saw both on the PE and the corporate side of the house is a need to really look at executing that meaningful operational change through integration that extracts value which sticks around for a longer period of time, again, than maybe in some of the prior cycles where we were selling into the multiple. And then in terms of some of the concerns is we are seeing a shift away from some of the more successful domestic deals that we saw during the 2007 survey into some of the bigger international deals that we're seeing now. We also saw a reduction in stakeholder scrutiny starting to allow a little bit higher premiums, a little bit more synergies, a little bit overpayment again. So we're interested to see what our next survey shows, but we're concerned that maybe it's going to swing back to some deals being less successful. So before we move on to the next slide, I'd like to turn to our, our corporate attendee, Jim. Um, Jim leads acquisition integration for Thomson Reuters. And um, Jim, with respect to kind of the tightening of the credit markets in particular, have you seen any difference in the competition for acquisitions? And was there any impact on the degree to which you had a price synergies and your valuations to win? Yeah, we've seen a lot of difference over when we were acquiring companies in 2007, 8, and 9 than than what we're doing today. And just like you indicated on the slide, in 7, 8, and 9, we were acquiring mostly domestic or U.S.-based businesses. Uh, in late 2009, we started uh, doing more global. And last year, uh, we did we were quite extensive in our, our global acquisition process. Um, we did some 30-odd odd deals around the world last year, uh, bought 30-some-odd businesses. Um, we've, we've seen a lot more flexibility in pricing and what we're paying for things, and we're starting to look at maybe evaluating uh, the businesses a little different way. Um, the due diligence process and what we've learned in the market space as we go more international has influenced uh, how we look at an acquisition and maybe some of the measurements in the what we call a, a, a business plan or a board paper that we put together to evaluate the business, uh, it is a uh, ex ever exchanging thing that you have to do. You can't really stay, say that you can go to an acquisition and, and understand that you can do the same thing over and over again. Um, it's it's an art form along with uh, science. So uh, we've seen, as we said. I've, seen a lot of difference in the way we've evaluated deals now than we were doing it a couple of years ago, and it will change again. Can't agree more. The deal market definitely moves in cycles, and um, it will be interesting to see the results of the next set of surveys from us, FBI, and others. So kind of moving to our next slide, you know, we want to ask what was the primary rationale for some of the deals in this particular time period? And what our survey showed is growth was the, the, the biggest factor by far. Um, the responses show clearly that companies had come through their cost reduction phase. They're looking for opportunities to develop new markets, increase market share, boost revenues. Almost half of our respondents, around 48%, cited increased market share as a primary deal driver. Next highest was 35%, pointed to geographic growth. Geographic growth may be similar to what um, Jim she shared with Thomson Reuters. And 27% on horizontal diversification or other strategies to, to expand their growth sectors. So, Jim, again, if we can turn to you, you know, without sharing, obviously, anything proprietary about Thompson Reuters' strategy, do these results at all align with some of your goals some, for some of your recent deals? 
Uh, no, they actually line up extremely well. Um, those three things, although in a couple of them might be closer than the other ones, were exactly the bottom line as to why we were acquiring businesses over the last several years. Um, I want to go back to the, the statement that was made about um, having a, a refined and very distinct strategy before you start acquiring. That is something we do religiously, and we evaluate it year by year uh, and go back and present and get high-level approval on the strategy uh, before we, we go acquiring businesses uh, every year. So I think those three things that you've got boxed in here, the top three balloons, uh, pretty much align very well with, with our, our thought process in acquiring companies. Perfect. Thanks, Jim. So we, we kind of talked about what was the goal behind some of these deals, and again, a heavy focus on growth. Now let's, on the next slide, let's look into how companies evaluate the pricing for those transactions. And we see a little bit of a difference here from the perspective of that we focused on growth. The focus on that from the diligence perspective wasn't quite as clear when it came to pricing. And what we showed is though growth was the major driver, the highest amount of attention is still being paid to the cop element. So we look at the numbers. Respondents reported an 81% focus on cost reductions for the growth deals, with analysis of the growth itself placing second at 64%. And what we feel like we're seeing is that corporates continue to remain skeptical of putting revenue in the pricing model. But, um, you know, 10 years ago, the same view was taken of cost synergies. We're starting to see an increasing amount of sophistication in the approach to building out your revenue synergies, but as the survey shows, the, the focus continues to be heavier on costs. So, again, Jim, we can turn to you. I mean, you've done a lot of deals over the years where there was, you know, more or less pressure to price in the synergies in order to support the valuations. We kind of compared, you know, our survey period versus as credit is starting to get, you know, more accessible again. Can you share any insights from your perspective into the difficulty of estimating value and then those executing costs versus revenue or growth synergies? Which one do you find hardest to estimate and also execute? Um, actually, I'm going to say both, um, and there's a, and here's my reasons why. We, in some deals we did several years ago, uh, depend, and this once again is depending on size. If you do a small deal or, or a large deal, your direction may be changing as to what you focus on, uh, depending on the strategy of the deal, what you're buying, um, how large it is, whether or not you're getting into a market you've not been into before, uh, or n not only a domestic market, but also a global market you've not have been before. Um, we've found if you focus really lately, if we focus too much on trying to estimate cost energies, we could damage the business we're acquiring. Uh, and we tend to focus on those cost energies being more out years than current year. Uh, what we found also by doing in, in the due diligence process, a lot of times, or even the people that are doing the evaluation of the business, uh, don't always understand what it takes to operationalize some of the decisions that are made in these synergy meetings or synergy discussions. Uh, because when you do due diligence, sometimes maybe all the people that need to know aren't brought into the deal, and there's really good reasons for that. So what we've tried to do, and over the years, and we started this back in 2005, is have a dedicated uh, deal after deal integration team, uh, so that we bring people that are into the due diligence process that can really understand if, if somebody says we can save a hundred thousand uh, dollars by collapsing technology, somebody can raise their hand in the room and, with some experience and say, uh, no, that isn't going to work in our structure. And by the way, you're going to damage the business assets that you're acquiring, probably people as well as assets, by by walking in the door with immediate cost savings from that perspective. We also find that man, it, it, totally focusing on revenue also is, is a little dangerous because we tend to say we can do things based on our experience in this market if it's somebody we're acquiring in a marketplace we know, and we've learned to be a lot more conservative in that way. Our focus has been really on we want this business, we want it to be successful, we want it to migrate into Thomson Reuters and be successful. That's why we're acquiring it. So in the first year, at least, we try not to stress the operation out too much and give us an opportunity to really know, really learn the business, learn the assets, and leverage them appropriately within our company. 
Perfect. That's helpful, Jim. Now, what we want to do next is actually look into some of the diligence that respondents did. And um, I think this slide, the next one, will be interesting from some of Jim's comments. Now, when we, when we looked at where companies were focusing their time, the vast majority continues to be on financial diligence, tax intention. And even though companies were reporting, the reason for the deal was growth, and the, you know, the, the implementation of that growth is typically through your operational changes. When you look at where the diligence was focused, it was your traditional financial. Let's look at and pick apart the balance sheet, you know, in, in the profit and loss statement. Much lower level of focus on the operational, strategic, IT, and human resources areas, which really speaks to a successful integration. And then when we look at the next slide, in terms of the amount of synergy analysis itself that was done at all prior to completion, 44% of our respondents um, reported none or very little. Only 34% a reasonable amount, and just 22% they said they put a whole lot of focus on it. So, Jim, if we can ask you, I mean, as a global integration, I mean, you're the guy that's responsible for taking the deal from the doing the deal team and operation delivery, you know, making it successful. So, to what extent do you ever find yourselves, or, you know, what's some of your approach on making sure that some of that operational HR and IT diligence that is so critical to executing the deal is being done? you know, early in the deal deal stage? Well, we may be a little different than most companies in that we don't buy manufacturing companies. We don't have cars or, or, or manufacturing plants that we acquire. We acquire software and people. So we actually spend a lot of time during due diligence on the whole HR question. Um, and so, and we, and because we're a technology company, we spend quite a bit of time on the, um, technology phase of it, too, because it's really people and technology that we acquire. And, yes, we have facilities, uh, but we require leases. We're not, we don't usually like to buy a facility. Uh, but we've learned that because we're so people-focused, if we don't have enough time spent on the HR piece, uh, we could have significant assets and intellectual property in the in the form of a human being walking out of the business due to frustration after close or the way they were treated during the due diligence and the deal process. So we've learned that lesson the hard way in the last several years, spent a lot more time on the HR piece of it, a lot is as important as finance. Yes, I would probably say we spend probably more time on finance like most businesses do uh, because that's how we evaluate what we're acquiring. But uh, there's been a huge um, – focus on HR and technology um, and, and the operational synergy issues that we're, that we're focusing on when we're acquiring this business over the last two years. Perfect. You know, and Jim, some of your comments about the focus on the people issues is a perfect segue to this will be our last slide before we kind of close out. And um, we did ask our respondents, what were these top three people issues that they looked at? You know, Jim just mentioned retention, people walking out the door. That was the, the highest focus area of the, the companies that we talked with. Then there was general culture, you know, um, recruitment, harmonization, you know, comp packages, all those kinds of things that you would traditionally see. You know, I know in, in being a guy who's done integration for a long period of time, there's a lot of tactical operational implementation to making an integration happen. But the thing that really matters, at least from our experience, is the soft stuff. That's what makes or breaks the deal. And maybe, Jim, that we can ask you for, you know, one last kind of insight from the Thomson Reuters perspective. I mean, what did you guys find? You know, there's lots of blocking and tackling, tons and tons of tasks that need to get done. But from your perspective, how do the soft issues weigh in in terms of what's going to make one deal successful versus the other? Well, I think they're huge. Uh, as, as I tell my, my team, and my team is diverse, while I have people on my team that you could say were project managers, uh, I look for skill sets on my team that are that have more business experience and relationship management experience because we, when we walk in the door as employees of Thompson Reuters, we we're so we feel so strongly about that this is a good company to work for that we want the people that we're acquiring to see that in everything we do, how we behave in meetings, how we treat them, how we address them, how we handle their. Um, emotional issues, how we deal with change in their company because we're basically changing almost everything that they've been used to doing and are comfortable with. Uh, we focus a lot on, on the soft processes. Relationships and an integration and an acquisition are extremely important to the, 
as important as the numbers, I think, to any integration or acquisition activity. If the culture fits within our existing culture and the relationships we create during the due diligence process as well as the integration process are done well and it's a great experience, is it totally happy? No. There are going to be issues. You're going to have to deal with it. And that's where those relationships and the ability to communicate and, and deal with, with people through this process makes has such a non-measurable but very effective impact on the outcome of any acquisition, in my opinion. Thanks, Jim. And to, um, to kind of close out this, this um, portion of the discussion, another top five lessons for corporate, and I think we'll see a very similar alignment with, um, with what FTI shared a few minutes ago. You know, if, if the, at the highest level, just really an importance on tracking and analyzing and reporting on the success of, we, we comment here on revenue synergies, but it's really synergies overall, just around the market perception of the value drivers and making sure it's aligned to deal rationale. And then Jim mentioned in their process, you know, they always look back and evaluate how did the deal perform relative to the goals that were set out when they decided to commit the capital. The second point is it's just a new approach to due diligence and planning with more emphasis on that future growth, doing that strategic and commercial analysis. You know, a plan for a shift from local deals to more multinational deals. We mentioned our survey showed that domestic deals tend to have a little higher probability of being successful. But for some of the growth, especially globally, we are moving into multinational deals again. So just make sure your deal processes are set up for it. Don't ignore the people issues. We just talked through that. It's so critical to focus on human resources concerns. And then the last one is institutionalizing your transaction processes so you can learn from prior deals. And we're seeing an increasing number of companies that are building out M&A playbooks or integration playbooks, really making sure that they don't reinvent the wheel every time they embark on a, on a new transaction. So before we close out, Jim, any other lessons you want to share just from your years of experience doing deals, you know, key takeaways that weren't reflected by FDI or these points here? Uh, I think uh, in the due diligence process, what we've learned here is due diligence is a skill. Uh, it is not something that you can send somebody to that's never done this process before and expect them to come away with what you need. In due diligence, it's not what's, in a lot of cases, it's not what's said, it's what's not being said. Um, even though a lot of times it sounds really good, if you you can get wrapped up in the, in the sales pitch and not hear what's really going on. Um, as we've indicated, while you can run all the finance numbers and crank the numbers, it's the people that you're buying and the people will uh, be the ones that perform what you're trying to estimate you can get out of the acquisition. So people, evaluation of people and the human capital issue is extremely important. You can have, you can have a great detailed integration plan. Uh, you need to customize it for what you're acquiring. Don't expect a $3 million acquisition to go through, sit down and work through with you uh, a 10,000 step integration plan. It, you'll you'll kill them, you'll kill yourself. So you need to be able to understand what it is you're acquiring and customize your integration plan, your people plan, your process plan based on, on the deal, on the deal size um, to be successful. And lessons learned after every deal, sit down, have a conversation with your team, with the people that worked on the deal, what did you do right, what did you do wrong, and don't just make it an exercise to check the box off. Learn from it and reevaluate to continue to prove. This is, as I said, the, the, there's a blocking tackling piece of this, and we've learned there's an art form to it. The art form you learn through repetitiveness, uh, so hopefully you can have a dedicated team that works on this all the time, uh, but it is very engaging. It's an exciting thing to do. A lot of people want to participate in it. Um, and so learn, you know, from your mistakes and, and grow through it. it. It can be done. You can be very successful at it. Perfect, Jim, and thanks again for participating. It, you know, um, it's always good to hear from the, the, the deal side of the table and the issue that they advise us. So thanks so much for your, for your insights. I think now we're going to talk a little bit about some best practices for legal due diligence. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Okay, great. Um, so, um, the legal due, this is Daljeet, and I'm going to talk to uh, Tony, Barry, and I are going to talk about uh, the legal due diligence side of things. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot about how important due diligence is in, uh, in evaluating a transaction, and I can't stress enough that you know, the legal side of things is, is also very important to make sure when you're you know, structuring a transaction that you've done your legal due diligence, because obviously any legal issues that uh, appear could either prevent a transaction from happening or also have a financial impact going forward um, on the transaction, and to the extent you can identify these issues up front, you can adequately protect for them in your transaction documents by making sure you have appropriate indemnification rights, um, making sure you have appropriate uh, lease size escrow amounts, um, or appropriately um, address any caps or baskets that, that you put in place um, for your indemnification breaches and any covenants that are you, put, you place in the document. So that really, you know, the due diligence you do, it not only helps you value whether you're going to do the transaction, it also helps you uh, evaluate and negotiate what you're going to put in your actual purchase agreement when you, when you do the transaction. Uh, you know, we're talking to talk a little bit about legal due diligence here today, but, you know, like we heard from the others on, on the call, it's, it's not just legal due diligence, there's financial due diligence, operational due diligence, HR due diligence, et cetera, that goes on um, in, in evaluating a transaction. So it's very important that everybody is talking to each other, and it's not just the legal is done in isolation and the other due diligence is done in isolation. It's, uh, legal due diligence is just one element of it, but it's important that everybody is coordinating um, and understanding the business at a higher level um, and not just focusing on different different areas. Uh, in terms of legal due diligence, the things that uh, we normally focus on is, you know, we're looking at document review. Uh, you're reviewing, you know, major contracts in the company. You're reviewing the corporate documentation. Uh, a lot of times for assignment issues um, and also to see if there's any uh, landmines that might be in any, any of these documentations. Uh, you also uh, diligence regulatory approvals to make sure that there aren't any approvals that may be needed in foreign countries, um, any other um, special you know, government approval that might be needed. And, you know, we focus on statutory searches. We do, um, you know, lit litigation searches. We do lien searches to make sure that there aren't any liens on the assets because, even though the company may tell you you're getting it free and clear of all liens, you want to make sure you investigate what might be there in the public record so we can make so you make sure that those liens are removed um, before you uh, enter into the transaction. In terms of the uh, you know basic documentation that you know we you see you know when you normally are buying a company you'll send out this laundry list of uh, of items that you're going to ask the seller to provide for you, which will range for everywhere from the basic documentation shareholder information, lists, of, lists and copies of material contracts, you want their financial statements, um, employee benefit issues, uh, you want to do some patent and trademark searches because if that's important to the business, you want to make sure you know all that they, you have the right um, to use those and they're not infringing on anybody else. Uh, lists of your tangible properties, uh, any litigation that may be out there that could provide exposure for you, environmental issues, and as we've all talked about, management. Knowing your people is very important, and, and who they are, what, what they're going to be bringing to the table, making them feel good, and also addressing their contracts. If they have contracts out there, uh, you want to make sure you look at those and um, and, ta and address those properly to the extent anything needs to be done with those going forward to keep them employed and, and with you. Uh, Tony, do you have any other uh, like insights on things that you look at? Uh, Tony has been a different perspective. You know, he works a lot with the European. Uh, you know, companies, and you know, they're not always the same sort of things that you look at right. uh, in Europe than you as you do here in the United States. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dalshi. Very much the same issues uh, from a European perspective. Perhaps the only thing I'd just add uh, in Europe is uh, often the need uh, for consultation with uh, employees or, or works councils. Uh, that can be uh, an issue which uh, needs to be factored in. Uh, in terms of timings and, and, and so forth. That uh, is quite a common issue we sometimes see. Um, and, just, you know, in terms of, the, like, you know, we talked about the due diligence here. You know, there's, there's different types of due diligence. Some is more target-focused because if you're going to be assuming a liability or assuming, uh, say, a loan agreement or a piece of litigation, you want to really target in on that and understand it properly. So if there's a loan agreement that you're going to be taking over, you want to make sure you understand that loan agreement, understand how it works. Uh, if there's a piece of litigation you're, you're going to be assuming the defense of, you really want to do some targeted investigation of that to figure out what the potential exposure could be uh, if you're taking that on. And then there's also the normal transactional due diligence, which is really looking at, at agreements and contracts and material contracts and figuring out if a consent is needed so that 
if you're you know there's going to be, if you're doing a stock transaction there's a change of control does the change of control trigger the the need to get the other party's consent um, and if it's a you know it's just asset deal and you're going to look to get an assignment of that contract uh, are you going to have to get the consent of the third party to make sure you and make sure you do that beforehand otherwise you risk uh, the ability of not being able to you know avail yourself of that asset that you uh, were intending were intending to buy. Uh, the transaction structure is also very important to your due diligence. Uh, if you're um, buying, doing a stock transaction where you're buying the stock of the company, you're going to be basically stepping into the shoes of the company and assuming all the liabilities uh, that that are there. So when you're when you're doing your asset and liability search and diligence on a company, that sometimes will help you frame how you want to enter into a transaction. Uh, I have a transaction I'm working on right now that we initially started out as a stock transaction and that's found out that there was just a whole lot whole host of environmental issues there that we just really didn't want to deal with. So we, we've kind of recrafted this as an asset transaction now and attempting to leave behind the environmental issues that uh that the buyer did not want to you know to even have any any taint of stepping into by doing a stock transaction and trying to get an indemnity from the sellers. Uh we we're trying to we're restructuring a transaction. So that's uh, that's important to you know look at those those types of issues as you're structuring your transaction. If things do pop up that uh, that are liabilities that you want to make sure you avoid, you, you know you can try to structure your transaction in a different manner so that uh, you, you don't take those on. And we've done many of different ways of doing that, where you have them create some shell entities maybe and, and spin those off pre-closing, and uh, you know and isolate some of the bad sectors of a company um, so that you don't have to step into those items that you find out during due diligence. Uh, and as we said, you know, due diligence is just a, it's a multi-stage process. You know, it's, it's it's ongoing. It goes on for months as you're as you're investing in a transaction. It's something where um, it has to be done, and it's very important to evaluate the risks in the company. And you really have to make sure that um, everybody's talking. The business people are talking to the lawyers, are talking to the finance people, and that everybody's got a good understanding of how everything mixes together. And it's not something that's done in, in isolation. Um, and in terms of you know what we do, and I think you know years ago you used to have due diligence where you'd go to some office somewhere and there'd be a bunch of boxes there where you you know you, you poured through that, which obviously made things a lot harder when you when you have multiple people working on it. I mean, nowadays I think most people you know that we we use you know virtual data rooms, which have made it a lot a lot easier for people to access due diligence information and upload due diligence information in real time, which obviously has been uh, a lot a lot easier for uh, for people to get things done. Tony, do you have anything else to add, or, or Jim? On, uh... Just my only final point would be that uh, your due diligence uh, report should really be a living document and not put in a, a cabinet just to uh, collect dust. It can often be very useful in the integration phase uh, for review and coming back to. So, um, you know, uh, don't put it in the cabinet. Okay. Yeah, this Jim. I have a couple of comments to make, too. Um, we've done... Here at Thompson Reuters, quite a bit of international acquisition, and Steve probably knows this too. Uh, we did a lot in Brazil last year. Um, it's a very interesting part of the world for us right now. Um, I would I would suggest to you too, as you go through legal due diligence, you you understand the culture of the country that you're going to be acquiring the business in. If you acquire a business within a country itself. Uh, the things that you would expect in the U.S. and the speed of things as they occur uh, won't apply, for instance, when you're in Brazil. The time has no uh, value to them. It's, it happens as it happens, and it, it causes a lot of frustration to people in the U.S., for instance, who are used to operating at the speed of sound on things. Also, I sat in a due diligence meeting um, in Sao Paulo last year, uh, where we sent out a formal due diligence list, and the seller said, oh, yeah, we'll, we have that. We'll bring it to you at the, at the meeting at the law firm. Uh, they came in with five grocery sacks full of papers, none of which had been tabbed or anything, and we had to sit as a – we asked a question on the diligence questionnaire, and they searched through five grocery bags to find a piece of paper to satisfy that. Also, you get a lot of things if you're dealing – trying to deal with uh, English – people in the due diligence process, a lot of things gets lost in translation. Even though you get trans they get translated to English from another language, there's a lot of content you miss. 
Um, so it's very important that you have, if you can, that you have somebody representing you in that country that's, that's from that country and actually speaks the language and can help translate what's going on. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about, which obviously is one of the most important parts, as we know, of an, of an acquisition is the integration and uh, some of the things. And I think we've talked about a lot of this before, but just to highlight some of the things that are really important as you're integrating a business. Um, obviously, you know, most of the – once you've acquired the company, I mean, it's going to hinge. It's either going to succeed or fail based on how you, you know, operate the company going forward as a combined entity, and the integration is obviously the key to, key to it. Um, because you have to you have to execute that plan. I mean, you can have the best plans in the world to to, to uh, integrate a company, but unless it's executed properly, you're, you're going to be set up for failure. So obviously, you need a good plan and a good vision, but also you need to execute that properly. And you know, I think some of the things to to focus on, you know, when you're going, you know, you're you're uh, integrating a company is you don't want to make you want to make sure that you don't disrupt disrupt the company right away too quickly. I mean, you want to keep some of the finances in play. Um, you know, your customers, you know, you're not ruffling feathers with your customers. I've seen some situations where after a company is acquired um, with some aggressive buyers, they're often in front of their customers asking for price increases and asking for changes in terms right on day one before they've even, you know, settled into the business. And obviously that's not going to be well received by them. Changing suppliers, you know, and ruffling feathers with suppliers right away, obviously you've got to manage your business in the best way possible. But, you know, on day one and right away to start, you know, rocking the boat with some of your suppliers and customers probably isn't the best, to do. the best thing to do. And then obviously you got to take care of your employees because the employees run the company. And, you know, you got to make sure that the you're not, you know, downsizing right away, you're not doing, having a lot of disruption where everybody's going to be afraid of their job and looking over. But when a new, somebody new takes over, everybody's obviously afraid. Is there going to be some, you know, transition and, and changes in the employment structure? So to the extent you can keep your employees engaged and, uh, you know, in, in the game, uh, not fearful of the job, it's obviously going to help with your integration plan. Um, obviously, again, you know, involve the people. That's not something that I've seen that's been very successful where you, you empower the people from day one and let them know they're a valuable part of this organization and that they're going to be involved in the transition plan and they have some constant communication about what's happening and why things are happening. They feel like they're invested. And also get feedback from, from your customers your employees and, and your personnel as to how things they think, how they think things are going, and have them have the ability to ask questions about what they see and what's happening as part of the, uh, the transition. Um, and obviously you want to, you know, balance all that with the consolidating consolidating uh, items um, in an acquisition to make sure you have the running the best business and being the most efficient. So obviously it's a balancing game, but uh, I think, you know, one takeaway I think we've heard from everybody here is that the people are important. And you got to make sure your people feel involved with what's happening and know what's happening so that they can um, be motivated to do the best job they can. They can make sure your integration works properly. Um, Jim or Tony, do you have anything uh, else to add on that area? That area? No, uh, this is Jim. For the sake of time, I, I think no. I think you pretty much highlighted most of the things that we, we highlighted through the rest of the, the meeting. Nothing further from me either. Uh, thanks very much. That's all I had. Uh, um. Okay, Delji. Uh, this is Mark. Um, if there's nothing else from the, uh, from the panelists at this time, I'm going to thank all the panelists for your excellent insights regarding the keys to a successful acquisition. If you uh, have any follow-up questions that you'd like to ask the panelists, Please feel free to uh, to reach out to them. Their contact information is uh, for each of them is on the slides uh, that you can see it right now. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation and ask that you please take 30 seconds to participate in our brief online survey at the conclusion of this call. These series are very helpful to us in ensuring that our NDI programs are providing you with practical advice and recommendations and developing ideas for future NDI topics. Thank you again for attending our NDI, and we'll talk to you next on May 23rd, 2012. Program details will be announced soon. I will now turn the call back to our operator. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's conference. You all may disconnect and have a good day.